I'm Bekiata, I'm in year 10 and I'm from Grace Dance High School. I'm Declan Davis, I'm from Grace Dance High School as well, and we're here to talk with Mitchell Resnick, creator of Scratch. I'm really happy to be here, so it's great to get to visit Australia and uh, to be sharing ideas with you, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about you know, the, the things you're doing here in Australia and to mm. share some of the work that we're doing at the place I work at the MIT Media Lab. So how, how's your time been in Australia? Do you, do you like it? What do you like? Yeah. So I just arrived yesterday, so it's still quite new, yeah. uh, but it's been great. I sort of arrived to a beautiful day and ran along the harbor mm. uh, and have already been having great conversations today mm. about all the types of you know, creative things that are happening uh, with, with education and learning here in Australia. So tell us your story. We would love to know how Mitch Resnick got to where he is today. Well, it's a, it's a long story, uh, but you know, I think after I graduated from college, I'd always been interested in math and science. I majored in physics, but somehow I didn't feel like I wanted to go on in that. Uh, but I'd written for my college newspaper, so I decided to become a journalist writing about science and technology, sort of combining many of my interests together. Yeah. So I did that for around five years. This was a long time ago. It was right when personal computers were first coming out to the world, and it was exciting for me to do that. But I wasn't sure I wanted to do that forever either. And then I was very fortunate. I met someone who really played a big role in my life. His name was Seymour Papert, and he was one of the great pioneers of technology and learning. He was one of the first researchers to think about how computers could be used by kids in creative ways. So I decided to shift my career, left journalism behind, and got involved with technology and learning. And I worked with him, and I've basically been doing the same ever since, continuing to come up with new creative ways to use technology to let kids learn things in new ways. So. Uh, in some ways, I think many people have to be prepared to, to make changes in their lives and start at one thing, but if it doesn't work out, try to do something different. Mm. Uh, so, um, what's your everyday inspiration to keep innovating? Mm. Well, I think I get inspired by just spending time seeing what kids do with the things that we create. So, I feel really fortunate with our Scratch software, mm. you know, there's this online Scratch community yeah. where every day there's 30,000 new projects that kids around the world share on the Scratch Online community. So looking at their projects always gives us lots of ideas. So I'm always inspired to see what kids create. Because even though we develop Scratch in my group at MIT, mm. uh, that you know, we're often taken by surprise by what kids do with it. Mm. Even though we developed it, we didn't know what people would do. So we we're always surprised and delighted mm. by what kids create. But that gives us new ideas as well. Yeah. We actually had an assignment last year in Year 9 for Scratch where we had to make like a game on Scratch. So I remember making Gallagher. I made Gallagher on Scratch. And, uh, and what, what, was your, what was your favorite part about the work on the project? I just found everything fun. I just found like it was a lot easier than HTML. I remember this year just being pounding HTML into us. It was just boring. But like we did three months of HTML and then we had a HTML test which was like awkward and you had to do this but Scratch it's just it tells you what to do in the coding it's like it does its own thing it's completely different it's easier to understand for people at our age. Were there some things that you found frustrating? I, I, Anything we can improve to make it better? No, not, not really it's just some things where I tried to put that there but it wouldn't work then I went on yeah. YouTube and then it's like Oh, okay, I should have put it in front of it uh, instead of behind it. That's how it works. Yeah. Well, it's good the added way to look up to find new things. Yeah. How about you? Have you had a chance to do things with Scratch? Yes, we made a racing car video game uh -huh. using Scratch. And, and, and what was that experience like? Did it was really good. Uh, it was uh, actually taught us how to use the codes and stuff to create a video game like that, uh -huh. rather than just uh, learning uh, by ourselves. Did, did you get ideas about other things you'd want to create? Yes, we could create a lot of games using mm. that. I know I made um, Fruit Ninja, so I had a mm. Surface Pro 4 i5, and I have a camera on the back, so I use the camera as a sensor, so I run off to like, uh -huh. my hand down the back, it cuts the fruit. Or if you slice the bomb, it blows up. Uh, that's good. Well, I really like when making projects that you can interact with, like yeah. using the camera to interact with. I think we're trying to do more and more things like mm. that, of projects that where you can interact with it, yeah. and use your body to interact. We're going to do even more things like that in the future. Yeah. We use Scratch in our Stage 5 IST class, as we said, and it is also used by millions worldwide. So what inspired you to develop it? Yeah, well, We first got the idea for Scratch by working with kids. 
So back 25 years ago uh, with a colleague of mine, Natalie Rusk, we started an after-school center for kids. And actually, it was largely for kids who you know, hadn't had so many opportunities in their lives. We want to give them some new ways of, to, to try some new technologies and to, and to do creative activities. So it was called the Computer Clubhouse. And kids would come after school and use new technologies to work on all different types of projects. But one thing we found is a lot of the kids, they wanted to create their own interactive stories and games and animations, but they couldn't find good software for doing it. You know, traditional programming languages you know, weren't right for these kids. You know, they you couldn't make use of that. But the other types of applications they could find didn't let them make the type of exciting projects they wanted to make. So it's clear they wanted to, you know, to, to make things, but they couldn't find the right you know, tools. So we saw this this real opportunity because we knew it was going to be a great learning experience for them if only they had the right tool. So we developed Scratch for kids like that who wanted to make their own interactive stories and games and animations. Uh, we wanted to give them the opportunity to create the things that they were imagining. Like all products, Scratch is continuing to evolve. Tell us about Scratch 3.0 and the new feature it contains. Yeah. So pretty soon in January of 2019, we'll be launching our third generation of Scratch, Scratch 3.0. And some of the things is, you better, we, our idea was to expand the range of things that you can do with Scratch. One thing is you'll be, able to, you'll be able to use Scratch on more different types of machines. Right now, Scratch is mostly used on laptops and desktops. It doesn't work very well on tablets. So with the new version of Scratch, you can be able to create project, create Scratch projects on a tablet and you'll also be able to run a Scratch project on a phone. So it'll be able to be much more flexible on all different types of machines and platforms you'll be able to use for Scratch. And it'll also be able to expand the types of projects you can work on. Uh, one of the things we've done is we made Scratch more modular, so it's possible to keep on adding new collections of programming blocks. We call these extensions to connect Scratch to other things. So like when Scratch comes out, there'll be a module for text-to-speech. Mm -hmm. So right now you can just type in text and your characters will actually start speaking. talking and will be speaking. That's not in Scratch now. So that will be one of these extensions. Some of the extensions will connect Scratch to the physical world. So like if you like building Lego robotics, there'll be a collection of blocks to control your Lego robots. Mm -hmm. Or like here's an example. We're also working on, in our group at MIT, we're working on this device. This is just a prototype. And this is like a little sensor device, and then you can plug it into things that you build. It's so like this was an example. Somebody in Scratch made a game with a flying bicycle, mm -hmm. but then they built these bicycle handlebars out of Lego yeah. bricks and put this this sensor block in here, so this communicates with Scratch. Mm -hmm. So now you could build a game and then build a controller for your game and do this to be able to control how your bicycle flies through the I game. Like customize what you're right. Exactly, customize your remote. Uh, so we really like the idea, the way we're, you were saying before about being able to interact with the things that you're creating. So this is another way of interacting with this you know, wireless you know, yeah. interaction you know, with the Scratch project. Because I think we're always excited to provide new ways for kids to create. So now this is two types of creating. You can both create something on the screen, but also create something in the physical world that interacts with what's on the screen. Uh, so we're always trying to expand the ways that people can create. There'll also be, with Scratch, with the, this next version of Scratch, lots of new uh, you know, images for sprites. You know, all the different characters available. There'll be lots of new characters of sprites, lots of new backdrops, and a lot of new things with sounds. You know, I think in the earlier version of Scratch, we focused a lot more on what things looked like, and we didn't do as much with sound. And now there's going to be a much better sound editor, and more ways to manipulate sound. So you could record your voice and, and put different special effects to it. Mm. So we're really trying to make it so that you can have Scratch not just create images, but control sounds sound. in all different ways. Because I know when I was using the sound in year nine IST, I could upload music onto Scratch mm -hmm. and then play it through the game. So like you've won and play music or while you're playing, you would play different tones like right. screeching around the corner when you on your motorbike mm -hmm. or your car or... Yeah, and we really like it. We like the idea of letting people personalize their Scratch mm -hmm. projects. So to take a sound that you find interesting and upload it there. So we always want kids to be able to 
sort of take different media and bring it together to personalize it, to put themselves into Scratch by adding their own images, their own sounds. And then with Scratch 3.0, you'll not just be able to add them, but manipulate them in different ways to make all types of special effects. So now we know Scratch, but what about Scratch Bits, Scratch Extensions, and Micro Rolls? And yes, we said it, Scratch 4.0. Tell us about your exciting future-focused projects. Yeah, right, so this is what we're, when I've mentioned this, this is what we're right now called the Scratch Bit, although we're probably going to change the name. We're still not sure of the name. This will probably be, you know, we're going to try to get this out for other people to use sometime next year. But again, we're really excited about just the way that it can, you know, extend Scratch off of the screen because, you know, we all grow up in the physical world and we live in the physical world. So you shouldn't just have to live in the virtual world when you use Scratch. We want to sort of pop out into the world um, and also to connect Scratch online so that you can connect to things like, you know, uh, text to speech and also speech to text. So you should be able to talk to your Scratch project and it should respond. You know, these days, uh, there are more and more devices that respond to voice commands. So you can you know, give a command to your television and it changes channels, or you can you know, talk to an appliance and it will do something. But right now, it's just other people are making those devices and people just get to interact with them. So we want to put that control in everybody's hands so that you could build voice control into your Scratch project. So you can make a Scratch project that other people could talk to to control the project. Uh, so that, that's another type of extension that we're adding on to Scratch. And with the extensions, we're going to add some extensions, like, you know, with, you know, like this one for connecting to the world. But also, we're hoping that other people make extensions, because although we think we have a pretty creative team with the Scratch team, we know that around the world there are lots of other really creative people. So we're trying to make Scratch open enough so that other people can keep adding things as well because we think we're all going to benefit if everybody gets to add things to Scratch. When we were doing some research on some of the amazing things you've done, we came across a thing called um, the Lifelong Kindergarten Program. What does a typical day look at at the MIT Media Lab in relation to the Lifelong Kindergarten Program and its physiology behind it? Yeah. So my research group at the Media Lab is called the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. The Media Lab is this special lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that focuses on creative uses of new technology. It's like there's one group that focuses on uh, creative ways that you can do new things with music and technology. That group is called Opera of the Future. Uh, or there's another group that does uh, new ways to use camera and imaging technologies, and they call their group the Camera Culture Group. My group does things with technology and learning and technology and kids, and we call it lifelong kindergarten because I've always been inspired by the way kids learn in kindergarten. You know, if you think of the traditional kindergarten, I'm not sure if this is the way it was when you were in kindergarten, but when I think of the traditional kindergarten, kids are playfully creating things in collaboration with one another. Art and things like that. Yeah, they, 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 they built towers with blocks yeah. And, yeah. and make pictures with finger paints and crayons. Was that what your kindergarten was like? Yes. Yeah, and I think that uh, I'm always inspired by that because I think kids learn a lot when they're playfully creating things with one another. Uh, like when they built towers out of blocks, they learned about structure and stability, and they mix colors together with finger paint. They learn how you know, colors work. Color. Exactly. And they also learn about the creative process. Uh, they learn how to start with an idea and create something and keep modifying it based on what, when they try it out. And I think that approach of developing as a creative thinker is so important today. I think, you know, you know today's world is, is changing so quickly uh, that you don't know exactly, like, you know, when you get out into the world, probably the world will be a different place, you know, a few years from now. So you don't know exactly what you're going to need. So the ability to think and act creatively will be so important because you'll be facing a never-ending stream of new and uncertain and unknown situations. So you'll have to come up with creative and innovative solutions. So I think kindergarten gets kids off to a good start. But unfortunately, and I'm not sure if your schools were like this, but after kindergarten, a lot of times, you know, schools is just with kids filling out worksheets or listening to lectures. Have you, have you had some of that in school? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I think the rest of school should be a little bit more like kindergarten. Both uh, hands on. Yeah, it's hands on and playfully creating things of people working together. Uh, so in the Lifelong Kindergarten group, we try to develop new technologies and activities 
for learners of all ages to do things more like kindergarten. So developing Scratch was one example. So although Scratch is intended for kids older than kindergarten, we still see it in that kindergarten spirit of where you know, kids are playfully creating things with one another. So when you make a Scratch project, like the ones you told me about, the games you were telling me, you were, you know, of course you were way beyond kindergarten, but I see it as a little bit like a kindergarten spirit. You were playfully creating things with the computer. Uh, testing then, how it looks. Exactly, testing it, revising it. So that's that kindergarten spirit. So that's what we're always trying to do. So if you come to the Lifelong Kindergarten group, you'll see the, the university students and researchers there are always trying out new technologies and testing out new activities and then studying what kids learn as they use those technologies. So in some ways, when we develop new technologies like Scratch, it's not so much different than when you're working on a Scratch project. When you work on a Scratch project, you sort of create a first version of the project and you try it out, it doesn't quite work, and you, fix, you try to make some changes to it. That's the same thing with us. When we make a new feature for Scratch or a new piece of physical hardware, we make a first prototype, we try it out. If it doesn't work exactly as we want, we keep revising it. So we do that same process. So I think we see the MIT Media Lab, even though it's at like one of the world's most advanced universities, it's a little bit like a kindergarten. We try to make our lab like a kindergarten. So even the university students in our lab are playfully creating things mm -hmm. with one another because that's how we think we get to be creative. In our generation, our generation are exciting times. We have much more available to our fingertips, but it's not enough to be a consumer of all it is. How to become a generation of creators? Yeah. So I do think it's important. You know, it's a little like imagine if you grew up and you learned how to read, but you didn't learn how to write. Right. Now, that would be really a shame. I mean, it's still useful to learn how to read. You know, you could sort of read a menu and you could read a street sign, but you couldn't share your own ideas. So I think for us, I think it's really important, you know, to let everybody share their ideas with the world. Um, so writing is one important way of doing that. That's one reason why I think it's important for everyone to learn to write. You know, even though most people don't grow up to become professional writers, but I think it's good for everyone to learn to write so they can express their ideas to the world. And I think it's the same thing as we think about new technologies. We don't want people just interacting with technologies, although that can be useful. You know, you can just interact with a, an, an app and that you can get useful things. But I think when you create with technology, you get to take your own ideas and get them out to the world and share your ideas with the rest of the world. So that's what we always want to do. We want to try to provide opportunities for everybody to develop their own voice and to, and to be able to share their ideas with the world. And that's what Scratch is about. We see Scratch, think of it as an extended form of writing. So with writing, you can tell a story. With Scratch, you can tell an interactive dynamic story. So it's the same type of thing, but with new media. So, you know, we try to give new ways of writing, but using new technologies, you can make even new types of things that weren't possible before. I am oh, I'm one of only five girls in this stage five ISD class. This is a nine to one male dominant subject. What advice do you have for females thinking of pursuing a career in this field? Yeah, well, I think some of it is also, we should give some advice for people who are the designers of technology and the educators creating classes and workshops to make sure that they create things that are appealing to kids from all different backgrounds and all different interests and across all genders. So I think one thing that we tried to do with Scratch was we tried to make it so you could use Scratch for all different sorts of things so that it would be appealing to all different types of kids with different interests, but boys and girls, kids you know, who like games, but also kids who like stories and animations. Uh, kids who like art, kids who like music, kids who like science, all of them can find something to do with Scratch. Uh, and I think we need to, we're, that's how we try to make it appealing for everybody. And I think we need to do the same thing with classes and activities. I know that like sometimes if, if you, somebody does a after school club and they just say robotics club, come build a robot for a competition, a lot of times it won't attract everybody. That's going to appeal to some people, but, but not everybody. If you do something like, if you say something like, you know, come and make a, a, a new, you know, interactive fantasy land, and you might use the same technology, but you're building like a, a landscape for a new planet, and you're making it come alive with lights and motion, that's going to appeal to a different range of kids. So I think we have to think about what type of activities do we suggest? 
So it's everything from how we design the technologies to what type of activities do we suggest. All of that can make a big difference of who's going to end up getting attracted uh, to these activities. So the first suggestion I have is that we need to do a better job of providing a wider range of technologies and activities to make sure that it's appealing to all different kids from all different backgrounds uh, and across all genders. Uh, and uh, for me, that's the most important thing that we can be doing. Um, there's just been the release of the uh, do, do you think that would make a difference? Like, for you, do, 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 does that make sense to you? Do you think that... Yes. Yeah. Because sometimes uh, some of the activities that we do don't set, like uh, attract females so yeah. much. It's, mo it's more of a, like, male attractive. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's so important to make sure that it's yes. going to appeal to, you know, to, you know, to, to everybody. Uh, and it's bad because then once it gets started, you get this bad negative spiral mm -hmm. because, again, if the class doesn't have, you know, many female participants, then other female participants won't want to join because they already feel that, oh, that's not for me. So it's sometimes hard to break out of that. You know, if it's in a bad place, we're going to have to work extra hard to make those changes. Any pressure. Yeah. Um, there's just the, in the release of the digital technologies and computational thinking in school curriculum in Australia. What message do you have for our teachers? Yeah. Well, I think see this as an opportunity to allow your allow the students to do a wide range of different things. So don't think of it too narrowly. Sometimes, and again, I don't know about the curriculum here yeah. and exactly what's involved, mm. but around the world, too often technology curriculums focus too much on teaching specific technical skills. And of course, it's useful to find some technical skills. But we should make sure that it's not seen just about learning technical skills, but also about using technology to do creative things that you care about. Um, so when you know, our approach, when we want to introduce a new technology is we have these four guiding principles, projects, passion, peers, and play. So we try to make sure that students have an opportunity to work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. Uh, so that's how I approach everything. When we develop a new technology or whether we're developing new activities or a new space for learning, like a new workshop or a new school classroom, we always are thinking about projects, passion, peers, and play. So with the new curriculum, I hope that the teachers would think the same way. How could they use this curriculum to let students work on things they're really passionate about. Because we know when you're working on things you're passionate about, you'll be willing to work longer and harder and persist in the face of challenges. That's true for students as well as for teachers and for adults. You know, everybody's going to you know, care more about things and work harder when they're working on things that they're passionate about. Or make a connection with peers, like make sure not to see the new curriculum as just a way for kids to work by themselves, you know, on their own but make sure they can learn with and from others. Because we know the most creative work happens when people are learning with one another and learning from one another. And then make sure it's done in a playful spirit. And when I say play, I don't just mean laughing and having fun. When I think of play, I think of play as a type of attitude where you're constantly experimenting and trying new things and taking risks and being willing to have things go wrong because you'll learn from that. So it's okay to, you know, to allow a more playful approach because that's where the most creative things will happen. So don't necessarily have to follow the script exactly, but allow people to experiment and try new things. And not just students, the teachers should experiment and try new things too. In the same way that students can learn a lot when things go wrong, and it, it's good for students to take risks and try new things. And don't see it as a failure if something goes wrong, but you'll learn something new and try it differently. I think teachers should do the same thing. That it's okay if teachers try something in the curriculum and it doesn't work, that's okay. They'll learn something from it, and they'll try it again and improve. So I think we all have to have that approach to learning that I see as a type of playful approach where you're willing to have things go wrong, and then you'll learn from that, you'll try something new, and you keep on adapting and revising it. So don't worry so much about getting it exactly right at first, but just try something, and we'll all learn it together. Um, creativity seems to lend itself quite easily to some faculties, like creative and performing arts the technology and applied studies faculties. Where is it always expected? Do you see schools exploring this focus in other curriculum areas? Well, I hope so. Uh, and it's true that it's not always easy. Uh, 
but I think it's important. So I think we, it's important to find ways uh, to allow you know, students to work on creative approaches to everything that they're learning. Because I do think that they're going to make deeper connections to the ideas, uh, and the ideas will be both more meaningful and more memorable when they're doing it as part of a creative project. So I think in all different areas it's possible to support these creative projects. And when you're working on a project, it often cuts across the different disciplines. That when you're working on a project, you know, you learn so many different things. Like I remember a scratch project I saw, this was from an elementary school student, was doing a book report. Uh, but as they were doing the book report, uh, on the screen, it was like an animated, you know, book report. And of course, they're using language. It was for a language yeah. class. And they were learning language, but also they had different characters, and their characters were like moving back and forth. And as they got further away, the characters Small. got smaller. And so if they were learning about their artistic idea of perspective, uh, and then to make it smaller, they had to use math knowledge about how to, if you want to change the size of time to become smaller, you multiply it by a fraction. Concrete objects. Yeah. So. They were learning not just language, but art and math. So for me, I think if you provide opportunities for kids to work on projects, it can cut across all the different disciplines and areas of study. So um, since we're going into year 11 next year, it's both exciting and scary. We would feel a lot better if we knew what the curriculum would not be rigid and boring in the traditional textbook work. We would give if we were to give you an item of technology and a subject area, can you tell us what classroom experience would be like? Like, I'll, I'll give it a try. It sounds like mm. it might be hard, but I'll mm. give it a try. So the first one is uh, drones and business studies. Drones and business studies. Yes. Mm. Uh, well, in business studies, you know, I would think, you know, right now I know there's a lot of experimenting with how you could, you know, change around the way businesses work if you're having drones. Like I know that certain people or certain companies are exploring could drones be used to de to deliver packages or deliver mail. So maybe the challenge would be, you know, how can you take an existing business and try to have it change around if you had access to drones? How would it change the business? Or how could you start a new business that wasn't even started it was, that doesn't even exist today if only you had access to drones? Um micro bit and geography. Okay. So with, uh, again, so with microbit and with everything, I'd always want to see kids mm, being the creators yeah. of things. So I can imagine, you know, doing something where I'm going to use the microbit uh, as uh, something that I use the sensors in the microbit to detect where things are on a map. So somehow I'll, you know, I use the microbit sensors so that as I interact with the map, it'll then trigger something on the and Scratch. So I'll have the micro bit connected to Scratch, of course, because I want to connect everything to Scratch. Uh, and somehow as I sort of interact with the micro bit, it will then send a signal to Scratch about what part of the you know, map I'm talking about, and it'll give me some extra information about that. And your last one is Lego Mindstorm and Mathematics. Uh, well, in some ways, that's an easy one, because I think almost anything you build with Lego Mindstorms, you're going to be learning a lot of math in the process. You know, like whenever you use gears, uh, you're going to start learning about fractions and ratios by putting gears together. Uh, so it's not so much that you would use Mindstorms, you know, in order to do a math lesson, but more you're going to need to learn math in order to make your project. So it's not so much that I would sort of do Mindstorms for a math lesson, but just use Mindstorms for, to make an invention. But in the process of making the invention, I know there's going to be a lot of mathematical learning by learning things like gear ratios, or if I have to have you know, my invention move a certain distance, I'll have to figure out how much, you know, some you know, relation between the time and the speed and the distance. So mathematical knowledge will come up in almost everything that I do. Mm. Well, um, this is all exciting, but I know my, my myself, I'd be much more excited if they put all this in, like, normal school projects. The same with Bagyard, I'm assuming, yes. yeah. So, um, I'd like to work. learn, how is that content going to be delivered? Well, again, and rather than saying it is delivered, I want to say more that I think that you know schools. I think we we need to. It's we have to make a, a bunch of changes in the ways we think about learning and education, because for me sometimes schools think too much about specific concepts that you need to learn, rather than helping you learn about the process of doing creative work. So, I think the first thing I would change you know is to 
shift around the goals of education. The, the goal shouldn't just be that you end up having learned a fixed set of facts and, and concepts, but rather that you learn how to be a good learner. Uh, but then if we can all agree that that's the most important thing to help kids grow up as good learners so they're prepared to learn new things as the world keeps changing, then I think we need to then to shift around the school to say, how can we help kids develop as, as, as better learners? Uh, and that's why I think like this project-based approach will help kids become better learners. And that's the least way I would organize a school. The year is 2022. What does the Mitch Resnick classroom look like? Yeah. So it probably looks a lot more like, you know, I mentioned we have these after school centers uh, where kids come in and work on projects and different types of collaborative teams. So when we set up our computer clubhouses, uh, it's not desks and rows looking forward. They're just clusters of tables in different places. Uh, has lots of chairs on, on wheels because you want to be able to move around and but sometimes I'm able to work with you on a project, then I want to work with you on a project, so we have to be able to move around. If I see something that you're doing, I might want to scoot over and say, hey, well, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. So make it easy to have groups of kids you know, you know, gathered together working on projects, uh, have lots of materials around so that you know, everything that I want to design with, there's you know, a bunch of Lego bricks and craft materials, mm -hmm. There are different machines for making things like 3D printers or laser cutters for making things. Uh, all different types of traditional tools, hammers and nails and saws. So all sorts of things so I could make things with you know, all different types of projects. And then set it up so it's easy for people to work together to sketch out plans. So there should be some big tables without any technology where I'm just going and sketching out ideas. Other places where we come together to start working together on projects. Around the room on the walls, I'd have lots of examples of projects to serve as inspiration. So as students look around, they see other projects that have been done in the past because that might spark ideas of you know, how they might want to work on projects, on new things that they would do. So trying to find a space where the space gives ideas, the other people give ideas. So it's a place where we always have lots of inspiration and then a way to work together to try out different things. Um, what advice would you give to teenagers watching this in Australia or US around the world? Uh, so to keep using your imagination and always remember that you're in charge of your learning. Don't see learning and education as something that's going to be delivered to you. And sometimes people have this model. They imagine education is like, you know, sort of pouring information into someone's head. And, and that's, not, that's not the way that real learning happens. So it, it, not to put pressure on you, but it's really on your shoulders. Of course there are going to be people around to help you your teachers, your parents, mentors, other people will help you, but ultimately it's up to you to become the best learner you can be. And draw on the, get advice from everybody, you know, because other people are there to help you, but over time you have to develop as a, a good learner, a good creator, um, and continue to do that through a lifetime. Um, and in doing that, you're gonna find the best way of learning things and creating things if you follow your own passions. So always you know, be searching for the things that really make you excited. Because if you fall, if you work on things you're most excited about, you're gonna make the best connections to ideas and you're gonna learn the most that way. So keep on exploring things that you care about and take charge of your own learning. Well, do you have any questions for us? Yeah. So well let me ask you, if you had to change one thing about your school, what's the one thing you would change? Oh. I don't know. I think I'll just have like a particular subject which focuses on like game making and software and computers. Like there's IST, which is like, well, you use things like um, spreadsheets and you make VR and things like that. But more so like kids that want to get into like the gaming industry. So like creating software to games and creating the computers and building the actual computers so you know what you're doing. Like, me and my father are currently building a computer for my brother, which will last, like, forever, because hmm. our last one, like, just died <laughs> recently. So I'm, I'm interested in that sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm. And how about you? If you had to change one thing about the school, what would you change? Uh, I would make the classrooms a bit more creative for the students to learn. 
because sometimes it's just the boring normal work that mm -hmm. we get so if it's a bit creative it might even engage students into the more classwork yeah. and all the other stuff we do yeah. and do you have any idea that when you finish up with school do you have any ideas about what you want to be doing afterwards well, after school, I, I want to join the Navy. I want to go down to the Australian <coughs> Defence Force Academy in Canberra huh. and do a business degree mm. uh, and come out as a um, maritime warfare officer. Well, you have a pretty, pretty, pretty yes, clear yes, plan yes, in mind. Yes. How about you? I want to do e uh, either physiotherapy or journalism. Wow, that's also a lot of plans. But the one thing, I think it's great that you have plans, but also, I guess the one advice I have is if you follow those plans and it comes... And, and you continue to be happy with it, that's great. But also, make sure that, you know, you leave yourself some flexibility. That it's okay if things change. Don't feel bad if things change. Even if you now think it's one way, uh, to leave yourself open to getting new influences and new ideas. Because you never know when you'll meet some new person or encounter some new idea that might capture your imagination. So leave yourself open to that as well. Uh, I sometimes think when we talk about working on projects, we sometimes talk about planning and tinkering. And when you plan, you sort of like come up with a plan, and you execute it, and then you're done. And that can be very efficient, and it, and it can be very good if, you have, if you're a good planner. But not everything always works that way. A lot of times, the most creative things happen. When you start, it doesn't quite work, and then you make a change. And we call that tinkering, where you sort of playfully make something, you keep changing it and modifying it. And I like to think that people can lead their lives that way as well. Sometimes it can work out just to plan your life and you have a five-year plan, you follow it and you achieve it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But don't feel that that's the only way. Sometimes I feel that we're led to believe that that's the best or the only way. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think you should also leave ourselves, you should leave yourself open to tinker with life. To have always experiment, try new things, be ready for the unexpected. And it's okay if you shift course later on. Thanks for Thank meeting us. Okay, well, it was, it was really nice yeah. talking with you. Mm. Uh, so, and uh, and one, one, one thing we always say in the, in the scratch world, we say keep on scratching. And you yeah. can think about that as keeping on, you know, continuing working with scratch, but I see it even more broadly. When I say keep on scratching, I really mean keep on creating, keep on learning. So for, for me, mm. scratching is sort of a metaphor for how to sort of continue to experiment in life. So I hope you keep on scratching and we have for you here some scratch cats, yeah. so you can each have a scratch cat sticker. Yeah. Uh, so Thanks. to remind Thanks. you to keep on scratching in life. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, really nice talking with you.